Hi, good morning. Good morning, everyone. Today, we are going to discuss about the age-related intestinal obstruction. So, the previously, we have discussed about uh, the types of intestinal obstruction. There are two types of intestinal obstruction, the dynamic and adynamic. And today, the, uh, the intestinal obstruction we have to discuss about, there are some age-related intestinal obstructions. So according to the age, there are various types of intestinal obstruction. There are common types and there are uncommon types. So according to the age, we have to uh, decide what are the types of intestinal obstruction. It's more common. So if we divide the age-wise, the neonates, infants, and young adults, we will divide it into young adults and middle age, as well as elderly. So we are going to see what are the most common causes in neonates, infants, young adult and middle age, as well as elderly people. So if you take the causes of intestinal obstruction in neonates, the first one we discussed is the duodenal atresia. So duodenal atresia is one of the common type. And then we have imperforate anus. So imperforate anus, usually uh, it should be checked whenever the newborn is born. Uh, usually it is checked with the thermometer. So that is one of the mandatory examination immediately after the uh, birth. And then volvulus neonatorum is one of the other condition. Then the Hirschsprung's disease and meconium ileus. So meconium ileus is definitely it is associated with cystic fibrosis. So usually the meconium is uh, liquefied by the pancreatic enzymes but in cystic fibrosis that is will be detective defective so because of that uh, the meconium will be thickened and that will cause us uh, meconium ileus in uh, neonates so these are the common causes in neonates when we take the the causes in infants then there will be a intussusception so intussusception is the common condition we have to check it's in the infant period. And then there will be a Hirschsprung's disease. So we, everybody knows it's called a, a megacolon. So that is again one of the cause in infants. And they can have a strangulated hernia. So within three months, there are child, they have a increased risk of uh, strangulation if they have a, a hernias. So that is also one of the conditions we have to check. And there are obstruction due to Meckel. So there are obstruction due to Meckel's diverticulum. So that is also one of the common cause in intestinal obstruction in infants. So everybody knows the Meckel's diverticulum is one of the congenital remnant of vitellointestinal tract, and it has a band. And whenever there's a band, it can cause intestinal obstruction. So that is also one of the cause in infants. If we take the intestinal obstruction in a young patient, so the middle-aged people, the common cause is the strangulated hernia. So we need to check whether there's any strangulated hernia. With that, when they have any other uh, surgeries, the previous surgeries, then additions, as well as the bands, we have to consider, as well as they can have Crohn's disease also leads to intestinal obstruction. So Crohn's disease, it is an intramural disease. So whenever there's an intramural disease, that will cause us uh, a constriction of the small bubble mainly. So that can lead to intestinal obstruction in young as well as the middle-aged people. So cancers also, it is possible in this uh, middle-aged people, but it is, it's rare. It is not a common condition compared to the elderly people. Then if you consider the intestinal obstruction in elderly, so usually the elderly, again, additions, we have to think of, think of it if it is a previous abdominal surgeries, as well as strangulated hernias also. It is common whenever they have hernias. It is also one of the common condition. Then they can have colonic cancer. So in elderly people, the f number one cause for colonic, cancer, uh, colonic obstruction is colonic cancer. So we have discussed that. So a small intestine, the common cause for intestinal obstruction is adhesive obstruction. And when it is, comes to colon, it is a colonic cancer is the common cause. And that is common in elderly people. 
and they can have a volvulus. There's a special type of uh, twisting of uh, bowel, the sigmoid colon uh, mainly. It is a volvulus, so we, will, we are going to discuss that is one of the special type of uh, intestinal obstruction occurs mainly in elderly people. Then colonic diverticulitis. So whenever there's a diverticulitis, that can lead to fibrosis, and that fibrosis uh, also can lead to intestinal obstruction in elderly people. And as we discussed earlier, there are impacted feces is one of the common, one of the common cause in elderly people and mainly the bedridden people. So that is also to be checked. So that is why the digital rectal examination is mandatory whenever an elderly patient presents with intestinal obstruction. So these are the causes. So uh, we have discussed the causes according to the small intestinal causes as well as colonic causes. But in real situation, whenever a patient comes, we have to check the common causes according to the age. So a newborn or an infant or whenever a young adult or a middle-aged people or elderly people comes, according to the age-wise, we have to know what is the common causes of uh, intestinal obstruction. So one of the single best answer, you can read first before we go into the other section. So, it's a single best answer question. A nine month old child admitted to hospital with crying, lasted for 10 minutes. He has similar attack for last five hours and he also passed red color stool. On examination, he is quite well. He is not pale and no abdominal abnormalities. And, but except there's a vague lump in the right hypochondrial area. So what is the probable diagnosis? So there are conditions is asked, Michael's diverticulum, whether it is intussusception, whether it is pyloric stenosis, whether it is paralytic chylias, and whether it is a duodenal atresia. Can anyone answer, what is the answer for this question? Intussusception, answer B. Why, why it is intussusception? Mm. Tell me the reason. As the child is month old, as the child is nine month old and present with crying that lasted for ten minutes, and it confirmed by red color stool. Okay, so so the answer is into susception. So into susception is one of the special kind of uh, intestinal obstruction in uh, infants. So we will first uh, discuss about into susception. There's a true or false question in intussusception. So intussusception is most common in children from six to 12 years. Is it correct or not? It presents with colicky abdominal pain, rectal bleeding, as well as the abdominal mass. It's 10% presents with diarrhea and vomiting suggestive of gastroenteritis. And if no shock of peritonitis, hydrostatic reduction can be attempted. A Mika's diverticulum can induce an intussusception. The other true or false question, what are the features of intussusception? There's a sausage-shaped mass in, is present on palpation. CT is helpful in diagnosis and ultrasound with a reduction by AINMA is preferred over the barium. And tumors such as lymphomas present with intussusceptions. The pressure is applied during the saline reduction is 100 millimeter H2O. So we need to know the, uh, how much pressure we can apply in intussusception to reduce it. So if you take intussusception, it is common in five to 10 months of age. So everybody should know it is it is not comes in years it is comes in months so we have to uh, know the exact month uh, a child develop into susception so it is usually it is five to ten even though we say it is five to ten it is the common cause uh, common age any age patients can develop into susception so remember that even 
two years, three years, even 10 years, people can develop into susception, but the usually it is occurs in five to 10 months. It is more common in males, right, compared to the females. And there are various types of intussusception. We can have ileocecal intussusception or ileoiliac intussusception or colocolic intussusception. So there are various types of intussusception. But out of that, 77% of intussusception occurs in the ileo, uh, colic or ileocecal. Right? Ileocecal intussusception is the commonest type. That is 77%. And when it is, comes to colocolic intussusception, that is, it is mainly, it is due to colonic cancer. So that is why it is occurs in elderly people. But ileocolic, it is occurs in five to, in between five to 10 months is the common cause. There are three parts. Whenever there's an intussusception, we have three parts in intussusception. We have an inner tube, and there's a middle tube, and there will be an outer tube. So in a tube, we call it, it's an intussusceptum. We call it an intussusceptum. And the outer tube, we call it intussuscipients. So these are the parts we will get in intussusception. So you can see uh, the ileum, it has gone into the cecum and then it is forming uh, three layers. So the inner layer, we call it an intussusceptum as well as Outer layer, it is into suscipients, as well as there will be a middle layer in between these two. So these are the layers. It is very important because we will discuss later in investigation in ultrasound scan, we will find these layers in a cross section. And that is one of the uh, diagnostic feature of intussusception in ultrasound scan. So you can see the diagram here. So in the diagram, you can see the into suscipients that is outer layer and in the susceptum that is the inner layer. And you can see here in the apex, right? In the apex, there is a point is called lead point. So this is the lead point. So you can see this apex here. So that is called lead point. So this lead point can be a physiological lead point. In, uh, we will discuss that uh, now. That there is, it can be a physiological or sometimes it can be a pathological. There are some pathological condition also, it is act as a lead point. So there should be a lead point for intussusception, intussusception. So if you take the causes of intussusception, so commonly it is occurs in infants and out of them, it is 90% of them, it is due to idiopathy. So idiopathic is the most common cause in infants. Sometimes it can be related to upper respiratory tract infection or gastroenteritis. So in upper respiratory tract infection and gastroenteritis, what will happen? There will be a hyperplasia of the PS patches. So whenever there's a hyperplasia of PS patches, that will act as a lead point. So that is not a disease condition. So that is why we, I told it is kind of a physiological lead point, right? Physiological lead point. So that is why, uh, when child is associated with upper respiratory tract infection as well as gastroenteritis, people will get uh, into susception. So usually it is, uh, majority it is idiopathic. So the pathophysiology suggests it may be, it is due to weaning because the time period, the five to 10 months is the time period for weaning and the passively whatever they acquired from the maternal immunity is uh, lost in that age, as well as the common viral pathogens Will be there in that age group. So because of that, it is acting as a lead point because of the hyperplasia of the PS patches. But when it is comes to children, right, if it is more than one year or two years time, there will be one third of the, uh, this child will have a lead point. So there will be some kind of a pathological lead point in these children at about one third of the time. So usual, the pathological lead points are Meckel's diverticulum. So if, if they have a Meckel's diverticulum, that is also act as a lead point. Or they can have a polyp. Even children, they can have a polyp. So polyp can cause us again into susception. Usually people with uh, having a polyp will have a recurrent into susception. And sometimes Hinox condline purpura is also causes uh, into susception in this age group of uh, children as well as appendix. When the appendix is there, that is near the ileocecal junction, that is uh, uh, 
that is also act as a lead point. So the ileum will uh, telescopes into the cecum. So that is also one of the cause or one of the pathological lead point. But when it is, comes to an adult, it is invariably associated with the lead point. So in infants, most of the time we don't know whether it's uh, why the lead points are there. So it, that is why we call it physiological, but it is suggestive. Sometimes it's a hyperplasia of uh, pear patches. When it is come to children, one third they will be having a lead point. Uh, and when it is comes to the adult, invariably there will be a lead point. So that is why in adult persons with into susception, we have to find out there should be some lead point. Otherwise, they usually they don't develop into susception. The common cause of polyps. So they can have a polyps, even Peutz Jagger syndrome. So whenever there's a Peutz Jagger syndrome, is one of the condition uh, children or in young adults they will have a polyps, and it can have a submucosal lipoma sometimes, as well as tumors like even the lymphomas. Whenever the lymphomas, even in children or young adults, they can develop lymphomas. So that is also can lead as a pathological, uh, pathological lead point. So there should be a lead point in adults and one third of the children as well as in uh, sometimes in infants. And even that also it is a physiological. So these are the causes of into susception. Next one is the clinical features. So clinical features are usually the child presents with a sudden onset of pain, right? They will have a sudden onset of pain and it is intermittent. Usually it is in intermittent. So that is what we call episodic screaming. The child will have an episodic screaming and it is last about a few minutes, two, three minutes. And, and during that time, the child is very, very pale and child is irritated. And after one or two, three, uh, uh, two or three minutes later, the child will be on rest. And there won't be any pain or screaming attacks. And that will last for some time. And again, it is intermittently the child will have a screaming attack uh, due to pain. And during the pain, the child will roving up the legs towards the abdomen or towards the chest. And vomiting and diarrhea also sometimes it is present with intussusception. Even though we say it is uh, intestinal obstruction, they can have some kind of a diarrhea in intussusception. So this is occurs in 10% of people. So because of this, gas, acute gastroenteritis is one of the differential diagnoses for intussusception. Because in intussusception also you can have the same features as gastroenteritis in 10% of people with vomiting and diarrhea. There can be a bleeding that is mixed with the mucus. So blood mixed with mucus is present as a red current jelly stool. So red current jelly stool is one of the main feature in intussusception. So any child present with that, we have to have a high suspicion on intussusception within five to 10 months of age. Then there will be a sausage shaped mass around the umbilicus. So it is around the umbilicus means it is, it can be on right side or it can be near the right hypochondrium. Even it can be on the left side. So wherever it is possible, but it is around the umbilicus and the, uh, and the, the curve is towards the umbilicus, right? Curve is towards the umbilicus. So that is about the sausage shaped mass. So you can see the sausage shaped mass here. So the concavity, it is towards the umbilicus. That is the usual presentation. So when it is comes the superior portion also, you will have the concavity that is towards the umbilicus. So this is the, again, one of the examination finding that give right, that will tell you it is an intussusception. Then the right iliac fossa will be empty. So that is what we call the sign of dance. So in the sign of dance, the uh, right iliac fossa is empty because the ileum and the cecum will be pushed into the distal part of the colon. So because of that, there will be an empty right iliac fossa. And abdominal distension is not an early feature, right? In child, when the child presents, usually they don't have an abdominal distension in the early stages, but when the intussusception is keep on going or if it is continuous, then they will have a abdominal distension as the late features. So child will be having a dehydration, so they will have severely dehydrated and intussusception can lead to bubble gangrene. 
and that can lead to peritonitis. So intussusception again is one of the condition that can lead to peritonitis. So you have to exclude peritonitis whenever a child presents with intussusception. So when we consider the differential diagnosis of uh, intussusception, one is acute gastroenteritis, and the other one is the Henox condyline purpura and a rectal prolapse. The diagnosis are acute gastroenteritis and Henox condyline purpura and rectal prolapse. And acute gastroenteritis can mimic as gastro uh, 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 intussusception. At the same time, gas acute gastroenteritis can lead to the hyperplasia of the um, appears patches and that can also lead to intussusception. So acute gan gastroenteritis can be a differential diagnosis as the same, at the same time it can lead to intussusception. Henox conline purpura also the same. It can be a differential diagnosis at the same time it can be a, it can lead to uh, intussusception as well. So rectal prolapse is again one of the uh, differential diagnosis in intussusception because the intussusception, the segment, the intussusceptor segment can come through the rectum and it will mimic as rectal prolapse sometime. So it can go up to that distance uh, when there's a severe intussusception. But we can differentiate this. The rectal prolapse, there will be a continuity with the perineal skin, the anal skin. There will be a continuity with the anal skin. So we have to uh, keep our finger around the prolapse and we have to check whether we can insert the finger in between the whatever the prolapse segment as well as the anus. If you can insert a finger in between these two, the, uh, the prolapse segment as well as the skin that indicate it is an intussusception. If we can put a finger into that, it is an intussusception. But in rectal prolapse, the prolapse segment and the uh, anal skin or peri perineal skin will be a continuous one. Right, so that is how we can differentiate this uh, rectal prolapse from the intussusception. So these are the main differential diagnoses. When you consider the investigations of intussusception, always we have to start with the abdominal X-ray to see whether there are any features of uh, bubble obstruction. So we can see the, whether there are any dilated uh, bubble loops. At the same time, there will be a uh, absent cecal gas shadow is also it is indicative of uh, intussusception because we have discussed earlier the sign of dance the right iliac fossa will be empty so in that case you don't see any cecal gas gas shadow then the barium enema so whenever we do a barium enema barium enema can be used as a, a redu reduction method as well so it is considered as an investigation as well. So barium enema, there will be a sign called a flow sign. So you can see it is the flow, crap flow. So it is the same appearance you will get in barium uh, enema. So that is what we call flow sign. So that is one of the feature in uh, barium enema. Then the ultrasound scan abdomen. So ultrasound scan abdomen also, there are two important features that we it will uh, tell us it is an intussusception. It can be a target sign. So in an intussuscepted segment, if we take a cross-sectional view in ultrasound scan, then that is tells it's a target sign. There's a sign called target sign cross-section. When we consider the longitudinal section in ultrasound scan, that will appear as a pseudo-kidney sign. So it is called pseudo-kidney sign. So these are the two signs uh, we will get in ultrasound scan that will indicate it is a uh, intussusception. Then there can be a CT scan. CT scan is the most important investigation nowadays. So it is very, very most sensitive investigation. Even the target sign will be very prominent with the CT scan. So CT scan is the most important or sensitive investigation nowadays. But even with an ultrasound scan, we can uh, suspect it's an intussusception. So this is uh, what we have discussed about the target sign. So the target sign, you will see the appearances of layers. So you can have an outer layer, you can have a middle layer, you can have an inner layer. So we have discussed already, there are three layers in intussusception. 
So these three layers appears as a target, uh, target sign. So that is what we call it's an important uh, feature in ultrasound scan. Then we can have a longitudinal sex section as a pseudo kidney sign, or it we call it a sandwich sign as well. So again, that kind of a layers, the three types of layers, uh, it's give rise to the appearance of pseudo kidney signs or a sandwich sign. So these are the two important signs we will detect in ultrasound scan, target sign as well as pseudo kidney sign. When we consider the management of uh, intussusception, it is mainly there are three, uh, four types of uh, management in intussusception. The first of all, we have to resuscitate the child. So resuscitation is very, very important. So we have to go for uh, IV fluids and we have to start with the broad spectrum antibiotics as well as nasogastric drainage or nasogastric aspiration. See, these resuscitative methods should be done for each and every child. So the child will be severely dehydrated in sometimes. So always we have to uh, we have to have an IV fluids uh, to resuscitate his uh, dehydration. Then we have to check whether the uh, whether the child is having a features of peritonitis because I have told you the intussusception can cause a strangulation and because of the strangulation they can develop a peritonitis. So that is the first step after the resuscitation. With the resuscitation, we have to check whether the child is having any features of peritonitis. So if a child is having any features of peritonitis, the saline or hydrostatic reduction should not be done. So everybody should understand that. The saline, the second management of saline or hydrostatic reduction should be done if a child is not having any features of peritonitis. If a child is having a features of peritonitis that's suggestive of strangulation, and straight away the child has to go for surgery. Otherwise, if a child is not having a peritonitis, we can go for a saline or a hydrostatic uh, reduction. Nowadays, the most important management more than the saline and hydrostatic reduction is the radiological reduction. So radiological reduction is superior to the saline or a hydrostatic reduction. Usually the barium or air is used for radiological reduction. Whenever we use barium, we have to check the segment is reduced or not with the X-ray. We can do it with an X-ray. And whenever we use air, we can check that with an ultrasound scan. So these are the radiological reduction method. So which one is superior? Air reduction or a barium reduction is superior? So both are similar effectiveness, right? So nothing is superior, both are same. But radiological reductions are superior to saline or hydrostatic reduction. Then we have to go for a surgical management. So surgical management, it is usually considered if it is an intussusception is not reduced, right? So if a child is having an intussusception and the saline reduction is failed, even a radiological reduction is failed, then we have to go for a surgical management. So these are the mainly four types of management we have to consider. First one is the resuscitation. Second is a saline reduction or hydrostatic reduction. So that is the easy way to do it in the wards. But the superior one is the radiological reduction. And if it is a reduction is failed, then we have to go for a surgical management. So this is how the saline reduction is done. So usually the child is having a, uh, is sedated as well as the child should have a, a nasogastric tube. And then the, the white bow catheter is inserted into the buttock and the buttocks are uh, compressed with a plaster. So otherwise the, the leak will occur. So it is compressed with a, a plaster and then the normal saline is connected to the catheter and the saline height is kept in one meter from the child. So that is the pressure you have to give it. So it should be about one meter. So one, uh, one meter from the child level. So that is the most important one. Why? Because that pressure is mandatory. What is the pressure we are giving? Because it's one meter, we call it's a hundred centimeter H2O. It is like blood pressure is measured by millimeter mercury, how much the mercury is raising. So we calculate according to that. So the same kind of things. 
when the saline is kept one meter away from the child, the pressure is 100 centimeter H2O. So that is the pressure we apply. So if it is, if the height is more than that, then the pressure is high. So that can lead to even damage to the bowel. And if it is the pressure, the height is less than one meter, then the pressure is not enough to relieve whatever the uh, intussuscept, yeah, whatever the intussusception. So that is why the level is kept at one meter and uh, the pressure applied is 100 centimeter H2O. So if you go to the, the first question, it's a single best answer question. So again, nine month old child. So in this, if anyone is thinking of uh, pyloric stenosis, pyloric stenosis usually occurs in an infant, right? Infant, uh, the newborn, neonate. So ne whenever the neonate uh, born within about weeks time, the people will have uh, features due to pyloric stenosis. So that is why even though the lump is over the right hypochondriac area in this question, it is not pyloric stenosis because the age is mainly suggestive of uh, intussusception and all the features, the crying lasted for a few minutes and there are similar recurrent attacks and recurrent jelly stools. All that is indicates it's a intussusception. So that's why its answer is intussusception. And if we go this question, intussusception. So true or false? True or false question, intussusception is most common in children from six to 12 years is false. It is five to 10 months, so already we have discussed, but intussusception can occur in any age, even in children, even in adults, we can get intussusception, but six to 12 years is not the common age. So that is false. And it's presence with colic abdominal pain, rectal breathing and abdominal, abdominal mass. So it is one of the presentations or rectal bleeding. It is not a fresh bleeding usually, but they develop a red current jelly stools, but you can have a bleeding. So that is one of the presentation. So it is not a common rectal bleeding is not a common presentation. It can present, but it is not a common presentation. And 10% present with diarrhea and vomiting, and it is suggestive of gastroenteritis. Yes, that's we have discussed. That is why gastroenteritis is one of the differential diagnosis for intussusception. And if no shock or peritonitis, hydrostatic reduction can be attempted. Yes, so that is what uh, we discussed. So if a child is having a strangulation, the child will be, ha be having shock or peritonitis. They will have a peritonitis so that all features is indicate we have to go for a surgery. So the surgery should be done if any features of shock or peritonitis. So that is, this is true. And Meckel's diverticulum can induce an intussusception. Yes, that is one of the lead point, pathological lead point. So that is, we have discussed, so that is also true. Then the next true or false question, the features of intussusception. There's a sausage shaped mass is present on palpation. Yes, that is one of the important clinical features to identify intussusception. CT is helpful in diagnosis. Yes, again, that is one of the most sensitive investigation nowadays, more than the ultrasound scan. But if it is CT is not available, then the easy access is ultrasound scan. Ultrasound scan with reduction by AR enema is preferred over barium. No, the barium reduction and the AR reduction both are you know, same effectiveness, so it is ultrasound reduction is not superior, so that is false. And tumors such as lymphomas present with intussusceptions, yes, we have discussed in adult, usually in adult or even in a young children, uh, a young adult, if you consider the lymphomas is one of the uh, condition that can lead to the lead point. So whenever they have this pathological lead point, they can develop uh, into susception. So it is true. So the special condition intestinal obstruction occurs in children. Mainly it is five to 10 months, it's the intussusception. And this is the other way that is in elderly people. Whenever the elderly people present with the intestinal obstruction, one of the special form is called volvulus. So we have to discuss a few things about volvulus. So 
volvulus is usually it is considered as it's a twisting or axial rotation of a portion of bubble on the mesentric axis so that is the definition of volvulus so it is not only the bubble even stomach we can have volvulus even gallbladder we can have volvulus but when it is considered well, commonly volvulus it is considered as bubble so it is usually the bubble is twisting in an axial rotation uh, twisting or axial rotation around the mesentric axis then that is what we call volvulus so volvulus they can have two kinds of problem they can have an intestinal obstruction they can have a strangulation so if it is a volvulus the rotation is more than 180 degrees then that can cause us intestinal obstruction and if it is the rotation occurs more than 360 degrees then they can develop a vascular occlusion and that can leads to strangulation and gangrenous bubble so that is how the rotation mainly occurs in volvulus and there are two types of volvulus that we can have one is the primary volvulus and the other one is the secondary volvulus so primary volvulus is due to some congenital problem or congenital malrotation or even abnormal mesentric attachments even a congenital band all it is a congenital problem that can lead to uh, the rotation we call is the primary so it can cause us a sigmoid called volvulus or even it can cause a cecal volvulus anything can occur due to primary but secondary is the commonest type secondary volvulus type is the commonest type and that is the it, it is due to the rotation of the segment of the bubble around any adhesions acquired adhesions or a stoma if we create a stoma and if a bubble is rotates around the stoma we call it a secondary if we if they develop any adhesions during their lifetime then that is again it is called secondary so you have to remember that adhesions due to uh, congenital causes is called primary but if a child, if a person is having an acquired adhesions then the volvulus is due to secondaries and the same time the volvulus can occur around the stoma as well whatever the created stoma so these are the two type primary and secondary so sites of volvulus we can have in sigmoid colon or we even we can have a cecum and even we can have a volvulus in the small intestine so sigmoid colon sigmoid volvulus is the commonest type compared to the cecum sigmoid volvulus is the commonest type and usually this colonic uh, the, the the always not usually it's always the colonic volvulus occurs the rotation occurs towards the midline so it is towards the midline is the rotation in any volvulus so in sigmoid colon it is in the left side so when it is rotates towards the midline it should rotate anti clockwise and cecum is on the right side and when it is rotates towards the midline it is rotates clockwise so cecum rotates clockwise to cause us volvulus and sigmoid colon rotates anti clockwise to cause us uh, volvulus so this is the commonest type sigmoid volvulus is the commonest type so we have to discuss about uh, sigmoid volvulus so that is uh, sigmoid volvulus can occur as a primary whenever there is a congenital addition so congenital bands again they can develop sigmoid volvulus but that is less or rare but sigmoid volvulus can at, at, uh, acquire some additions in their li lifetime in elderly people mostly it is due to uh, diverticuli so whenever there is a diverticuli there will be acquired additions and that can leads to secondary volvulus that is the commonest type in sigmoid volvulus uh, compared to the primary so it is usually occurs in elderly patients so it is one of the elderly people usually get uh, volvulus and it is again more common in males compared to the females and it is common in asian countries and it is usually the rotation always occurs in anti clockwise that is what we have discussed so this is rotation occurs towards midline so when it is occurs uh, rotation occurs towards midline it is anti clockwise in sigmoid colon what are the predisposing factors of uh, 
sigmoid volvulus. So mainly the predisposing factors are chronic constipation. If a person is having a chronic constipation or an elderly person is having chronic constipation and laxative abuse, then the rotation, uh, the volvulus occurs very frequently. So that is also one of the predisposing factors. As well as high residue diet, so that will increase the, the sigmoid fecal load. So that is also one of the predisposing factors. And there are some anatomical predisposing factors. So in anatomical predisposing factors, it is usually whenever there's a diverticuli, whenever there's an inflammation of the sigmoid diverticuli, everybody knows the diverticuli can occur in uh, sigmoid colon as well as cecum. But the sigmoid diverticuli is the commonest type compared to the cecum. And when the diverticuli is develop a inflammation, diverticulitis, there will be a additions around the diverticuli. And because of the overloaded rectum, and whenever there's a long pelvic mesocolon, and whenever there's a mesentery is having a narrow root, then the rotation occurs. So these are the predisposing factors for sigmoid volvulus. So always consider chronic constipation with laxative abuse, high residue diet, and there are some anatomical features that will give rise to uh, sigmoid volvulus. So here you can see there's a diverticuli. So with the diverticuli, you can have a diverticulitis. So in the top, there's a diverticuli and around the diverticuli, whenever there's an inflammation, they can develop some adhesions or fibrosis or band. So whenever there's a band is there in the apex and there's a long sigmoid colon. Whenever there's a long sigmoid colon with the loaded bubble, as well as the mesentery is very, very long and the root is very narrow. These are the anatomical predisposing factors for volvulus. So this is what we considered as one of the predisposing factors. How volvulus presents? So the presentations, you should know there are two types of presentation. One is called fulminant uh, presentation. The other one is called indolent present, presentation. So fulminant is the dangerous one that is acute, but when it is, comes to indolent, it is the chronic cause. The patient comes with the long history. So fulminants are sudden onset, and they will present with the severe pain, severe abdominal pain, sudden onset of severe abdominal pain, and they will have a vomiting as an early sign. So usually we discussed earlier in intestinal obstruction, whenever there's a colonic obstruction occurs, the vomiting is one of the late signs. But in volvulus, when there's a uh, obstruction occurs, they present with early vomiting. And the abdominal distension is very early and the abdominal distension is associated, they can have some hiccup as well as uh, retching. And the clinical course is very, very rapidly deteriorating. So the patient will be deteriorate very rapidly. Uh, that is indicated it's a fulminant cause of presentation. So these are the important things you have to consider when someone comes with the volvulus, whether it is a fulminant cause. The other type is called the indolent cause, indolent presentation. So the indolent presentation, it is comes gradually. So they have an insidious onset. It's a uh, disease is very, very slow progressive and they will usually have less pain as well as the vomiting will be the very late features. So in the history, we have to check whether he's having a vomiting as well as whether the patient is having an abdominal pain, severely abdominal pain, and whether the, what is the progression of the condition so that according to that, we can divide the presentation into whether it is a fulminant presentation or whether it is a indolent presentation in uh, sigmoid volvulus. We consider the investigation. So investigations, usually the mainly there are three important investigations to diagnose volvulus. Plain supine abdominal x-ray is one of the most important basic investigations we have discussed. So in that we can see the dilated uh, bubble loop. So that is indicate it is a, uh, the possibility of volvulus. They can, we can go for a contrast enema as well. So contrast enema is also can give the features of in, uh, volvulus. CCT abdomen is the gold standard. So you see CCT, if it is possible, it is the best investigation to diagnose a volvulus. But with a plain supine abdominal x-ray, 
we can mostly identify the segment of polyvalves. So usually you can see there's a two arms of bubble. So whenever somebody asks you to describe this X-ray, it is a dilated bubble with two arms. And in these two arms, the axis, right? The axis is runs from right to left as a diagonal, right? It's run as a diagonal, not a vertical, not a transverse, but it is runs as diagonal. So that is the typical feature to suggest it's a volvulus. So if you see this X-ray as well as in this X-rays, you can see there are two dilated bubble loops or bubble arm, and with the axis is vertical. So axis is it goes in a uh, uh, it is goes from right to left, and it is not vertical or it is not transverse. It is goes as a diagonal. So that is the feature that is suggestive of uh, volvulus. So here you can see the patient had a um, this uh, hemiarthroplasty as well. So this hemiarthroplasty indicate the patient is having a very old. Right, so anybody knows about the neck of femur fractures, the management. Whenever you have a hemiarthroplasty, it is indicates the uh, it is the management of an old patient. So this is again, it's indicate it is very common in old uh, patients. So that is how you suspect volvulus whenever old patient presents with sudden onset of severe abdominal pain, and the X-ray shows there are dilated bubbles with two arms and and the axis is running from right to left. Anybody tell me what is it looks like? Any sign? Coffee bean sign. Yeah. So this is the sign we call is a coffee bean sign. That's a sigmoid volvulus. Whenever you have a massively dilated sigmoid loops with uh, two arms, and that is mimic as a coffee bean. So coffee bean sign is one of the indicator of sigmoid volvulus. So the plain abdominal x-ray is very, very helpful whenever there's a sigmoid volvulus. So we can identify the dilated loop very well in a sigmoid volvulus. So the investigations mainly it's a plain abdominal x-ray. So we can go for a barium and we can do the CECT abdomen that is the best uh, or gold standard investigation. So the management, when it is, comes to management, Management is, we consider the resuscitation first. All the patients should be resuscitated. So it should be managed as intestinal obstruction. The patient should be managed as uh, intestinal obstruction. So uh, the resuscitation part, nasogastric aspiration is the mandatory, as well as IV fluids, as well as we have to keep the child, uh, we have to restrict the oral intake. And we have to catheterize to see the input output chart because the patient can go into dehydration as well as hypovolemic shock because of the dehydration. So catheterization and the input output chart is mandatory. IV antibiotic is again, it's very important because in any intestinal obstruction, the bacterial transmigration is the possibility. Even a common cell, just a common cells that can have a bacterial transmigration. So we need to prevent any infections uh, by giving IV antibiotics, as well as the, if a person is not having any features of peritonitis in sigmoid volvulus, then we can go for a sigmoidoscopy and then decompress whatever the dilated segment. So this is very important. Sigmoidoscopy, whenever you mention the, as a management of uh, volvulus, you always mention if there's no features of septicemia or is, there's no features of shock or if a patient is not having any features of peritonitis then only we go for a sigmoidoscopy like intussusception in intussusception also we go for a saline or a radiological reduction after exclusion of shock as well as peritonitis the same thing in uh, sigmoid volvulus you exclude peritonitis first and then we go for a sigmoidoscopy and after that sigmoidoscopy we have to insert a rectal tube. So rectal tube insertion is one of the important things in volvulus. And you have to keep the rectal tube for some time, at least for about 24 hours. Why? Because the even though we decompress the volvulus again, that can twist back again. So because of that, we have to keep the rectal tube for some time. And then if it is not responding with the sigmoidoscope or whatever the decompression, 
or if a patient is having uh, features of peritonitis, then we have to go for a laparotomy. Right? We have to go for a laparotomy. Usually in uh, elderly people, sigmoidoscopic uh, decompression is the better option because surgery will have high mortality in elderly people. So that is why the sigmoidoscopy and the decompression is better in elderly. But in young patient, if a young patient presents with volvulus, then we have to consider surgery and the resection is the best option in young patient. But in elderly people, we mostly it is consider the uh, sigmoidoscopic decompression is the best option. But if it is not responding to that, then we have to go for a surgical management. In surgery, we, we can resect the sigmoid colon, so it is a sigmoid colectomy, as well as we can consider the anastomosis. But if a patient is very, very elderly, and if a patient is having some comorbidities, then we can go for a Hartman procedure rather than going for an anastomosis. So the management, uh, the surgical management of sigmoid volvulus is either we can go for a sigmoid colectomy and anastomosis, or we can go for a sigmoid colectomy and then go for a Hartman procedure. So that is the management of volvulus. So we have discussed two special kinds of intestinal obstruction in children or even in uh, five to ten months of age, some special type of intestinal, intestinal obstruction is into susception. And when it is, comes to elderly people, there's a special kind of in, uh, intestinal obstruction is volvulus. So these are the two types of uh, conditions you should know because it can be asked in several MCQs as well as in SCQs. The short notes, even in short notes, the intersusception as well as volvulus can be asked. There's a one other condition called compound volvulus. So that is also one of the conditions that we can see. So that is the volvulus occurs with, with the uh, sigmoid colon as well as the ileum. So ileum twist around the sigmoid colon and it is making as a knot. So that is why we call it a ileosigmoid knotting. So ileosigmoid knotting is called is a compound volvulus. So this can lead to the gangrene of either ileum or sigmoid or sometimes both. It will be gangrenous of ileum or sigmoid or sometimes it's both. So that is because of the, uh, the severity of the ileosigmoid knotting. So usually this patient's presence with acute intestinal obstruction and because the ileum is involved here, the distension is very, very mild. It is not a significant or a uh, prominent distension in this patient compared to the sigmoid volvulus. So compound volvulus, the distension is very uh, mild because of the involvement of the ileum as well. And it is needs surgery, otherwise the bubble will go into gangrene. So this is one type of uh, volvulus you should know. It is called compound volvulus. Okay, so we will do a few questions here. This is one of the single best answer questions. So we have uh, discussed earlier the intestinal obstruction, the types of intestinal obstruction, dynamic as well as adynamic, and then we discussed about there are special types of intestinal obstruction. One is intussusception and the other volvulus. So with this knowledge, you have to do all the, most of the questions in intestinal obstruction. So this uh, single best answer question, a 55 year old female presented with the acute gastroenteritis uh, followed with abdominal distension. On examination, bowel sounds were absent and Bowel sounds absent and no vomiting. Potassium is 3.1, sodium is 140, chloride is 98. What is the probable diagnosis? Anyone? Paralytic ileus. Me? Yeah, so it is paralytic ileus. Uh, because the causes you can see, what are the causes of paralytic ileus? According to this case, uh, there are sounds and uh, there is hypokalemia. Yes. Uh, yeah. So, so it is mostly suggestive of paralytic ileus. Yeah. So why? Because if the patient is having an absent bowel sound, right? So whenever there's an absent bowel sound, we have to check whether there's any features of peritonitis. 
So anyway, absent bowel sounds is indicated as a palatic ileus, but it can be due to peritonitis as well. So we have to check whether there's any significant abdominal pain in this patient. If it is, uh, if it is significant abdominal pain and the features of peritonitis that suggestive of, there's an abdominal sepsis with kind of a strangulation is inside. Otherwise, it is just a paralytic ileus. So in this question, there are two conditions that can lead to paralytic ileus. One is gastroenteritis. Gastroenteritis we have discussed is one of the cause for paralytic ileus. The other one is the potassium. Even the potassium is low, then hypokalemia that can cause us paralytic ileus. So uh, this, the probable answer is paralytic ileus. Next one, single best answer. Which of the following features suggest a complete large bubble obstruction? First one, presence of multiple loops of bubble with plica circularis on abdominal x-ray. So this single best answer, which of the following features suggests a complete large bubble obstruction? The presence of multiple loops of bubble with plica circularis on abdominal x-ray. So plica circularis we have uh, discussed earlier, it is called valvule coniventus and valvule coniventus is it's extending from one side of the bubble ball to the other side of the bubble ball. So that is a complete circle, right? Complete line, complete line. So that is indicate valvule coniventus. That is a feature of small bubble obstruction or small bubble, dilated small bubble. So it is false because it is, it is not occurs in large bubble obstruction. Large bubble obstruction, the lines are incomplete lines. So this is false. Bilious vomiting. In large bowel obstruction, vomiting occurs very late, right? So it is one of the features we have discussed is vomiting occurs very, very late. And even whenever there's a vomiting, it is not uh, that kind of a bilious vomiting. So usually bilious vomiting, it is a feature of proximal small bowel obstruction. So it is not a, a feature in large bowel obstruction that is false. Distended abdomen, yes, they can develop distended third abdomen with high pitched bowel sounds with uh, normally passing platers is uh, it's false. They call, don't pass uh, platers whenever there comes to the colonic obstruction because everybody should know whenever there's an obstruction occurs in small bowel, the patient can pass some amount of platers. They can pass some amount of, uh, of feces. Why? Because the colonic uh, bacteria produces the gases and that gas can go as a platus in small bowel obstruction. But in large bowel obstruction, mainly there won't be any gas or there's no any platus or any feces. So that is why we call absolute constipation. So absolute constipation is the features of complete large bowel obstruction. So that is false. The empty rectum on PR examination no, again, even in small bowel obstruction, we can have an empty rectum. So you can't differentiate large bowel obstruction from small bowel obstruction due to empty rectum. So that is why it is false. You don't get empty, uh, you can get empty rectum in small bowel obstruction as well as the large bowel obstruction. Then the dilated loops of bowel with hostra is visible. So dilated loops of bowel with hostra is the uh, feature we have discussed. That is a hostra is visible as an incomplete line from one wall to the other wall. So that is the feature of large bowel obstruction. So what is the feature suggest a complete large bowel obstruction in this question? It is the answer is dilated loops of bowel with hostra visible. So that indicate there's a large bowel obstruction. The other question, can you read and try to answer? So the sing, a sing, single best answer, a 70 year old male presented with abdominal pain, distension and acute uh, constipation. He had noticed increasing constipation over the last three months and had lost 10 kilogram weight. And clinical examination reveals a tense and tympanic abdomen. So tense and tympanic abdomen indicate it's a grossly distended bubble or uh, abdominal distension. And abdomen shows a uh, abdominal X-ray shows a dilated cecum and proximal colon up to the splenic flexure. What is the diagnosis? Anyone can anyone answer? What's the diagnosis? Primary colonic tumor. Why? What is the reason? 
the age 70 years old patient yeah. and he presents with uh, loss of uh, it can be due to uh, colon cancer yeah very good so we have discussed elderly patient colonic obstruction the commonest cause is colonic cancer so that is definite so it is a single best answer what is the most probable diagnosis when an elderly patient comes with the colonic obstruction it is the colonic malignancy so the answer is primary colonic tumor and uh, usually the possible place of this patient the cancer is in the splenic flexure that is why the dilated cecum and proximal colon up to the splenic flexure is dilated usually the surgical option for this patient is extended right hemicolectomy so anybody everybody knows whenever the tumor is in the hepatic flexure or a transverse colon we go for a right hemicolectomy but when the tumor is in the splenic flexure we go for a extended right hemicolectomy so this this patient needs extended right hemicolectomy so that's all i want to discuss about into susception as well as uh, uh, volvulus so we have discussed about intestinal obstruction we have discussed about the types of intestinal obstruction and we have discussed about there are special types of intestinal obstruction so now you can do most of the questions related to intestinal obstruction uh, and whatever the essays or whatever the question it is asked in emergency vivas should you should be able to answer the each and every important aspects of intestinal obstruction okay thank you